Hi, Serena. Yay. Hey. Hello. How are you? Yay. I'm back. I'm ready. So happy. <laughs> We missed you so much. Oh, I missed all of you so much, too. It was uh, just a maddening travel scene. But I'm back. Perfect. Hi, Jamie. Hey, hey Jamie. Hello, everybody. How are you today? Great. Great, great. Excellent. This is a great one to come back to, too. <laughs> Artificial 3D printed robot skins. Sounds pretty awesome. I was thinking of attaching it to that robot with the astrocytes for the brain. Oh yeah, well, well we got to hook organoids up to these things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to ping people. I'm just going to uh, share the room and stuff. Which I'll be right back. Well, we could maybe just put the skin right on them. Maybe that would be actually <laughs> the first easiest to do uh, input, no? I mean, skin is well, pretty flat. Yeah, well, I wonder. I'm wondering if we could like scale little fingers down to very small dimensions. Yeah. And um, yeah, have complex geometries and then feed those into them too. Well, that we will so ask. Cool. <laughs> we'll definitely <laughs> get those questions in. Oh, yeah, and little actuators, and they have like, you know, 10, 20, 30 little tiny fingers. Cool I don't know why I thought of that. I don't know why I just thought of this, but could you imagine a toothbrush with tiny little fingers that cleans out your teeth really thoroughly? <laughs> that would be, I don't know why I just thought of something so weird. <laughs> Although, yeah, that's the whole angle, like medical robots, nanobots and stuff that have um, articulated senses like that. Go in and do things at a micro scale. Would touch be a benefit to these um, things, and um, after you know small nanobots stuff? Would they need to have touch, or would they just be able to be directed with, uh, you know, either with a human or, or with camera detectors and stuff? Well, it'll like, be really interesting to anything? see what the substrates are and what the limitations are, and or if there's like general principles for different materials. Mm. That'll be really cool. Because I mentioned like a biomimetic substance. Um, biomimetic, is that like biological, but it can be shaped? Um, could, could be. It just means in, inspired from, from biology. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting. It's the kind of, because I said in the, even the, the paper, but I was reading about how, um, like AI is developing to the the point of like you know like animal animal behavior you know we can program with animal behaviors and stuff like that in it um and like giving it touch as well I wonder I wonder if I could see like robot pets that we couldn't really tell weren't robots well I imagine we need astrocytes in the loop to get there oh yes 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 <laughs> yes absolutely. And it actually would be really interesting, right? Because um, they might respond to like a tactile um, feedback from outside. What you mean with the organoids? Yeah, yeah. Because you're like a. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah. well, you know, at some point that it's it's kind of the interesting question because they are. It, it is human brain tissue. So, you know, we kind of know at, in its full on natural state, that's certainly what it does. Yeah. But how much do you get for, you know, you know, approaching that incrementally? Um, that's going to be pretty fascinating. Yeah, 
possibilities are kind of wild. Yeah. Hello, Cesarium. How are you? Hi, Cesarium. Hi, everyone in the audience. We'll start in a few minutes. Um, it will be really interesting uh, to learn from Professor Nathan Lepore. He's at the University of Bristol and he um, is a professor of robotics and AI there. Um, maybe in the meantime, I can rather share his lab website, uh, pin that on the top for people who are interested in his work. Um, there we go. And um, yeah, we will start soon. It will be really interesting. He is really, um, yeah, he did some really interesting breakthroughs and uh, will be great to learn from him. Thank you for coming. I mean, the skin part is really, I guess, to improve maybe surgeon robots and everything that needs like really fine skills, fine tuned motor skills. Um, so I, and then also for people that have um, disabilities, what I think is really interesting in that regard is, you know, previous Miguel Nicolili's lab where he built an um, exoskeleton for paralyzed people. And uh, the really surprising outcome was not just that um, paralyzed people could, without um, invasive technology, um, gain control of the, uh, over the exoskeletons by using like sensory input into the arms um, from like the surface, but then also regain some some abilities to control muscle movements and stuff. Hi, Nathan. There you are. How are you today? Thank you for coming. Hi, Nathan. Hi, Nathan. Welcome, Dr. Bell. So the unmute, um, to unmute, it's all the way on the bottom right corner. There's a little microphone symbol. If you press on that, we can, we can hear you. That's got it. I was saying hello to everyone. I didn't realize I was on mute. On mute. <laughs> there, there you oh, are. There we go. Welcome. Welcome. Here you now. Hello. How's your Friday? I hope everything went well. I know it's late, but it's the same time zone Jamie is in. Jamie is from Scotland. Yep. So. Oh, okay. oh, cool. Yeah, no, I've had a good day. I've, I haven't had many meetings today, which is always a, was a good day, I'd say. Oh, that's a great day. Usually my days are full of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so how do these things work? I, mean, I, I have to be honest, this is a bit strange for me, um, doing a meeting like this. Okay, yeah, let me give you a short overview. I'll also put back uh, your presentation back up so that you'll see it. Um, and um, yeah, so we will start in a few minutes. I'll give like a short introduction about um, yourself um, and then uh, one of us will um, ask like a couple of general interview questions like um, why are you in science? What happened to you? Like, <laughs> it will be way nicer. I just say it that way. <laughs> well, I'm happy if you say it that way. <laughs> I, love, I love the framing, Catherine. What happened yeah. to you? <laughs> yeah, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I, I won't be offended. <laughs> and then about your current field, like, you know why why you chose that field i we think it's kind of interesting for studying career um people and um you know general public that want to know more about yeah. the science world 
if that's okay with you and then it would be time for you to present like the presentation if you check on top like above our heads there should be a link and this okay. is how the audience will see it so they have to scroll through the presentation themselves so it's really helpful to say now i'm switching slides and maybe even mention the slide number that's, okay. that's really helpful and yeah and then we can open up for questions and yeah it's supposed to be fun i hope you'll enjoy it <laughs> yeah it's different it's nice to try something different out yeah yeah the cool thing about this is that it's a public room so everyone that sees the title in the hallway uh, can join um it will appear more for people that chose like they're interested in science, maybe in AI and robotics. Um, and um, it's very interactive, right? Questions. Um, so it's a little bit different than a podcast because you can just interact and um, yeah, kind of get to know the real scientist a little bit and ask questions. Cool. Cool. So basically, so I mean, I'll I'll do it as a normal talk because obviously I don't I don't know how to do anything else. But you know, I'm I'm really if if I get interrupted and people ask questions, I'm you know obviously very happy with that. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, that's perfect. We'll start in around three minutes. Hi, Chris. How are you today? Welcome. I am just fine. A friend sent me the uh, the paper there, and I was fascinated. I wanted to learn about some of the cobot programming and some of the joys you've been doing at the touch. That's absolutely fascinating work. Cool. Yeah. Well, please. Uh, I say, just please guide me as I go. If I'm going off on a tangent, or you want to ask about anything, you know, so I'm happy to to just treat it more as a chat. Cool. Honestly, because um, you're the one doing the talking, if you go on a tangent, it's because you feel it's important to share it. So we're listening, you know, we're uh, oh. we're here to you know, come on your journey. So, okay. This is Club's cool. house. It's made for tangents. Yeah, we're very, very <laughs> tangent friendly. <laughs> so how often do you do these then? Are these like weekly, is it weekly events you do these? Uh, well, Katarina is a bit of a force of nature and we, you know, it, it, there's been times where, you know, daily, we've been able to sustain daily um, wow. you know, presentations with guest speakers and variety of, of topics. And uh, we love to get off into the technical weeds too. So it, it, it's, not even epic, it's not even crazily rare to have two in a day. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's happened. Uh, several times um, and they've always been different topics and always been absolutely mind blowing. Katarina brings in a, an amazing selection of incredible people, which we are very, very pleased that you're one of them. Hey, well, thank yeah. you. Well, Clubhouse quality is all over the map, but uh, Katarina's rooms are always some of the, 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 the real treats. So we're really grateful that you could come here and, and share some of your knowledge with us, Nathan. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you first. Hi, how are you? First, I, well, did you know that we have gifts now and like we can share like thumbs up and stuff like that? I'll show you. I just I, like I to just see. noticed. Yeah. First oh, was you did. Well, first was sporting one, and I like. Oh, I didn't know Clubhouse could do that yet. And you can <laughs> give. So well. I didn't oh, know. So cool. I There's got teach giving an in onboarding meeting. <laughs> 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 Can you see mine? How, how do you trigger them? You um, d double tap and hold on your uh, on your on okay. your own on your own picture. There's the Friday gift for not having meetings on a Friday. I feel like we went to like 20 years of training and then we have meetings all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you feel. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's, it's, as a scientist, you kind of think, you know, you kind of think beforehand it's all like being in the lab or fiddling with technology, but in practice, it's sitting in meetings. <laughs> 
<laughs> and talking about regulations as they yeah. is, you know. <laughs> if you use them, especially in biology like ah oh, we want to order a new type of virus okay we need to get a hundred thousand regulations and, uh, <laughs> absolutely like right. fill in the million forms before you can get anywhere and then, that's how science yeah, happens and then lawyers yeah. Yeah. if you order it from another lab they are lawyers and, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're probably just hearing blah 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 no killer robots blah 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 <laughs> why does everyone always insist on the no killer robots I mean don't they know we're trying to do science here <laughs> <laughs> well, and then in the next phrase, you talk of, you hear talk about Skynet. So, <laughs> what, what the, the crazy part is, there's labs where it's like, all right, guys. So guess what? So we told everyone else you're not not allowed to do uh, 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 death robots. You're the death robot crew. You've got infinite funding. Do whatever you want. Just don't tell anyone, okay? <laughs> <laughs> then you well, get laughs. No, we're the Skynet group. We're the Skynet group. It's seen as defense to do that research. Because so, you're trying to anticipate what might happen to 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 you, so you do the research to create the technology. It's kind of crazy, but I've heard of these kind of arguments being put forward. And again, yeah, that's you a little you that's go, a little day jobby for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, now AI is making great inroads, as you can imagine. In yep. defense, it's sort of like the new battleground. And what's more important is they can dance Absolutely. and they can draw pretty pictures. And then, so regardless <laughs> of what kind of conflict we have in the future, we know there'll be great artwork for it. That's the important thing. So Skynet will be able to memorialize <laughs> us and have great dance moves from it. Yeah, the artwork gets cleared oh, for publication. No. <laughs> you weren't, you're, you're not talking about an AI version of Footloose or something, are you? Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just no. I won't be talking about that today. <laughs> okay, I think we can we can start. We can officially start. We can all start at the fun part first. <laughs> I'm just chatting. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone to the Science Society, uh, and a special welcome uh, to uh, Dr. Nathan Lepora. And before we start, let me give you. A uh, short um, overview, um, Dr. Nathan Lepore is a professor of robotics and AI at the um, um, University of Bristol. And um, he received an AI Lever Home Leadership Award. And um, he, um, he did his, um, at Cambridge University, and his um, PhD in theoretical physics um, in 1999. And uh, later on, he was a lecturer in robotics in the Department of Engineering Math at the University of Bristol and a reader in robotics. And then uh, from starting 2019, a professor uh, in robotics and AI. And um, Dr. Nathan Lepore um, is an uh, academic that has a lot of cross-disciplinary interests in robotics and neuroscience. And um, yeah, his main focus um, in his research is on robots um, that have, to create robots that have a human-like sense of touch and uh, manual intelligence. And um, yeah, it's currently, he says, an exciting um, area to be in with a lot of progress. Um, so yeah, we are very honored to have you here. And um, before um, you start with your presentation, um, maybe Cecira, him, uh, uh, and Jamie would like to ask you a couple of questions before we go into your talk. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Oh, well, thanks for the nice introduction and um, thanks everybody who's here, having a listen as well. Excellent. Um, I can kick us off then. Um, so first of all, welcome to Science Society officially. Um, it's great to have you here. Now I'll start off with cool. the first question. Um, what point in your life did you actually find yourself being fascinated by science 
And um, is there any special story to that that you can recall that you could share with us? Thank you. That's a, a, an interesting and difficult question. So I guess the question is why why am I now a scientist? Um, so I did I didn't take a very uh, conventional career path because as as Katrina was saying, actually my training was as a first as a mathematician, and then I did um, theoretical physics for my um, PhD, and I also had a research fellowship in that for a few years. Um, whereas, and then basically I had a I had a gap from academia for several years where I, I worked as a writer, and then I came back and I was looking at what what would be so there at that time I guess was when I reflected about what I would like to do with my life and um, you know kind of decided that being a scientist was what really motivated me and interested me so I kind of had a choice then the question was what what field to go in um, when given I got a background in maths and something like theoretical physics which is fairly you know useless for practical application so I, I thought first of all computational neuroscience that really interested me get into how the brain works. Um, and then from that, they kind of evolved into robotics because that's just kind of the way the, the you know, the opportunities, um, opportunities came. I don't know, does that answer your question? So a bit oh, very much so. Sort of look. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. I, I love how um, you're talking about how, you know, you tried to link it to your maths as well. So you were always still interested in mathematics, right? You just wanted to try and um, reach out into something where you could apply it and learn other stuff as well yeah 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 mm. because you know that's kind of what you know I was kind of good at you know in my degree that went well and my PhD so it's kind of given those skills and if you want to be an academic then the question you know what 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 is there that you can do and I guess the answer is you can do most things you know because most you know obviously science and maths underpins most most sciences and also the the ability to solve problems you know, which is ultimately what a maths degree is about. It's about problem solving. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Fisarihim, do you want to take the next question before we get started? Are you there? Oh, I think she's on the um, uh, other oh. work meeting. Oh, okay. At the same time. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'll, I didn't I'll just... <laughs> no problem. Okay, the last question then. Um, so what is it exactly the story that's led you up to working on what we're going to be talking about today? What's uh, How did that get your attention? How did you start um, working on it? And how was the journey for you? Before we get started, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so I guess why, why, did, why did I end up um, working on trying to create artificial tactile skin? I guess is, is, is the question. And like, um, so I say it wasn't a it wasn't a linear path for me at all. It was kind of what what opportunities came along at, at different different points of my career. What seemed like the next natural step to go on. So I was I so I was working in computation. I, I went, when I returned to academia as a, as a postdoc after I'd had a break for for five years or so from academia. Um, I I went to I was interested in modeling the brain, understanding say how the cerebellum or basal ganglia you know, work in, in terms of computational modeling of them. Um, and then um, basically I I was working on this, well, say the cerebellum at first, and then I moved to another research group at, at my um, at my institute um, who was working on um, models of um, how whiskers, how, how rats uh, perceive using their whiskers and doing neuroscience models of that and linking that into uh, robotic models of of the of whiskered robots as well so it's kind of like you you know you're trying to understand how the brain perceives the world using whiskers and then you're trying to build that perception you're trying to test that in a robot um so that was a fantastic project that I was on for a few years and then um i was kind of thinking to myself what do i want to do as my own career you know i was working as a postdoc there and and you know i was approaching like time to get get a permanent position, uh, become a lecturer. And and so I thought, well, I could take the knowledge that I have about neuroscience and tactile sensing with whiskers, but I could apply it instead to robot hands and human like human like robot hands and human like touch. Because I saw it as a more impactful problem. Because basically if you can get robots to have um, the capabilities we do with our hands, 
you know then then you know it you know it's a grand unsolved problem in robotics as you know just an enormous range of applications that you could do with that technology so i thought that was an interesting both scientifically interesting and an important area to to work in so that's that's why i moved into it that is an absolutely fantastic lead up thanks very much for sharing that with us <laughs> um now you're with now you're waiting our appetites um the stage is yours and please when you're ready uh, that's um looking forward to hearing your talk thank you okay brilliant well thank you um so i've got my slides I'll, i i will try to guide through the slides as i go but i appreciate some people may may not fancy staring and staring into a screen so i'll i'll try as well to to keep it kind of independent slides and and also um just interrupt me anytime i mean we were discussing this earlier you know i i, I mean you know this is for the audience and so you know in the sense the audience should should can decide where this goes as well. Um, so, um, so artificial three D printed skin that feels uh, that's that's what this um, presentation's about. About as I say, my lab we we both create um, artificial skin, three D printed skin, and um, we tr we try to impart that skin with a sense of touch that that has the same funk that has a similar functionality and capabilities as human touch that's the goal um, uh, okay so why why is human touch um, important for robotics well so the the human hand has been honed by millions of, so, so this is slide one but it's slide two so the human hand has been honed by millions of years of evolution into a general purpose manipulation device um, and nothing else comes close and from my kind of hand centered view of uh, humans, um, then, you know, I, I really see our hands as kind of what makes us human. Um, because, you know, with our hands, we've, we've created technology. I mean, technology is basically stemmed from, you know, devices we originally made by hand. And then there's been this kind of cycle of technology where that, 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 that those devices that we make have become ever more complicated and sophisticated. You know, until now we've got you know computers and you know and, and so on, but it all stems back to stuff that we we made with our hands, and and you know the intelligence that we had to use our hands in that way is is what led to to technology and and all the good things and bad things that that came came with it. So um, so it's it's a big problem in robotics to to you know to so if you could have robots that can have the capabilities we do with our hands. You know, there's many kind of uh, useful and um, 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 societally important things that they could do, you know, from, you know, sorting through our recycling uh, so that we become you know, far better at recycling our materials to, you know, doing kind of boring jobs that people, people, people don't want to do, but currently have to, uh, you know, to like efficient, more efficient farming. So it, it could be, you know, in principle, if it was a solved problem, it could be like a new industrial revolution where the you know, the, the, the automation could really, you know, come stride, come on strides and be able to do many things that we currently can't do. So, so to do that, I think we should, we surely then we should look to the human hand to design and deploy robots that are capable of human like dexterity. And the key funk, key aspect of how our hands work is having a sense of touch. Our hands are useless without a sense of touch. And, you know, we have our sense of touch is exquisitely detailed. You can almost think of it as like an eye in each of our fingertips in terms of its sophistication of our, of our sense of touch. So, you know, that, that's why, you know, having, if you want to have robot hands that have the capabilities of the human hands, those, sense, those hands will need to have a sense of touch that is as good as the human sense of touch. Uh, so when I was asking myself, you know, when I was moving into this area and looking into building up a lab, um, kind of asked yourself, how do, so how do you get a lab? What capabilities does a lab need to to develop novel robot touch? Um, so it's kind of tough because it's a very interdisciplinary area. Um, I mean, it's a bit, it's a, it's a completely unsolved problem as well. And it, if you want to do it in, in, in a way that draws on biometrics and biology, as I do as well, it means you have to be extremely interdisciplinary. You can't just view it as an engineering challenge, but you have to kind of view it as a kind of biologic, you know, but you want to take biological knowledge and expertise as well. So you'd kind of have combined soft robotics, AI for the intelligence, neurophysiology for how touch works. Uh, you have to build these things yourself as well because you can't buy them off the shelf. 
you have to know neuroscience, a bit of neuroscience, how a brain, brain interprets touch. And, you know, you also have to know traditional robotics as well, robot control. So it's kind of a tough problem. Um, and um, to do it, it's not something you can do just as kind of one person, uh, it's been, or even with a small group of people, because all the skills are so, so varied. So you need a very di diverse group of people and, a, you know, a medium sized lab, which, are, you know, are gradually built up over several years. And so this is a bit slide, slide forward, a picture of my lab um, 2020. I've been in the area for five years or so. And you said there's a kind of diverse group of people because there's a diverse group, a diverse set of interests, which is really important for giving that, that kind of span of, of viewpoints to, to tackle this problem. Um, and makes the work more interesting as well if you, if you have a kind of a diverse group of people around you with different perspectives and different opinions and different ways of looking at the problem. Okay, so the, the core technology that we... Um, we use in our lab is called the uh, TACTIP, BRL TACTIP. I didn't name it. I don't particularly like the name, but that's the name that stuck. Uh, TACTIP standing for tactile fingertips. So the the the, the technology was, was developed in 2009 by uh, Jonathan Roster, who's also at the same lab as me, uh, but kind of, if you like, is, is now working on different things. And, and I picked up this technology, as I say, about six, seven years, years ago, and then kind of um, I've been driving it forward in my lab. Um, and what makes it special, so that tactile sensing is a medium sized area in robotics. There's maybe, a, you know, 100 people in the world, you know, a couple of hundred, maybe 50 PIs, you know, a few hundred, a couple of hundred people working in the area. So it's small, but you know, it's medium sized, but, you know, nothing like, say, AI, which has like tens of thousands of people working in it. And our, our kind of unique selling point is our tactile sensor is... Um, combination of it it's soft so that you know it's kind of got a squidgy uh, feel to it which is important because you know our our um, fingertips are soft as well um, um now it's it's also optical so it has a camera inside it and i'll come to why this is important in, the, in a minute but basically that gives a a high resolution tactile sense and you know our own our own tactile sense is how it's high resolution as well we have thousands of mechano receptors spread across our finger fingertips um, and then the, the other kind of our unique selling point combines soft and um, high resolution with biometric. So we try to copy um, how human skin functions. Um, so we kind of say it's soft, biometric and optical. They're the key features. And then um, uh, an innovation we brought into the technology is we 3D print the, the skins as well using multi-material 3D printing. Uh, so on slide six, you can see that the multi-material 3D printing has enabled us to to rapidly um, innovate and um, you know progress the technology because you can go through quite a quick design cycle with with something that's 3D printed, um, and it's also now enabled us to you know make it in different shapes and sizes. And we even went back to whiskers again at the top right here. You can see there's a kind of whiskery version of it um, because because that's an area I used to work in. Um, um, probably the key development we've made, I would say, is to get it down recently in terms of the hardware is to get it down to the size of a human fingertip, which you can see in the kind of the anthropomorphic hand that's to, in the middle, in the central central row to the right. There's a there's a human like hand there. And actually one of those fingertips is, uses this technology um, and I say it's down to the size of a fingertip, which I think in, in terms of high resolution optical tactile sensors, we're currently the only lab. Um, that has miniaturized it down to that to that size at the moment um, and then the kind of things we do we do bring AI into the research so I'm going to come on to the paper in a minute but I'll just give the kind of feel for the for what what we for the span of work we do in in my lab so we do bring AI into the research as well and there the the, the goal is you want to be able to interact in real time um, using a sense of touch to control how the uh, how the robot um, interacts with objects to physically so tasks like for example we might like effortlessly just run our hands through our hair without thinking about it but it's actually quite a complicated control task to do that from a robotic perspective you have to basically use deep learn we were only able to get this kind of control using deep learning methods you know kind of advanced AI methods and combining it with conventional control um, there's a couple of videos linked to on slide um, seven. 
um, if you if, you know if you want to see kind of examples of the kind of control that we we get. Um, and then the way the field is going forwards is AI is really um, hitting um, is this technology so that you've got at the same time as the, the tactile sensors being innovated and say so becoming high resolution, having all these other good properties. Um, AI is progress is hitting the field as well. So the kind of techniques that were developed for computer and robot vision over the last decade are now coming into robot dexterity um, and and causing the field to develop quite rapidly. Uh, and one of the print, one of the key one of the principles that we we've, we've worked on and seems to be um, coming dominant in the field is is to use um, reinforcement learning methods. So say the kind of thing that DeepMind do in training uh, AI agents to beat human players at Go or Atari games, you can use those same reinforcement learning methods uh, to learn how to, for a robot to dexterously interact with the world. Uh, the problem is in, if you're trying to learn those things in the real world, um, you, 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 need, you basically need too much data. It's not possible to learn these, poly, these, 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 these skills in the real world because you know when with the methods that DeepMind developed for for learning how to beat the human players at go play billions of go games which you can do in simulation but you can't do that in reality so the methods that are coming in are you you learn how to to map from the real world into the simulation and then you can do the learning in simulation of how to do the dexterous interaction and kind of map it back to the real world uh, so these are some of the methods that we, we've been working on as well in our lab that's kind of the state of the art of the AI. Um, okay, so that's, if you like, the kind of background. Um, Nathan, I was just going to ask if, um, if this is okay. Um, yeah. When you're talking about um, taking an experience from outside and then put it in a simulation, is that like um, the this stuff would maybe touch something and then the simulation would run inside its head in the same way that um, I would feel something and then my brain would decide where I should feel next? like that so try, to try and kind of learn faster is, is that what yeah, you mean yeah it's it's so suppose you want to learn a skill you know you want to learn how to i don't know pour a jug of water into a into a cup or something or you know imagine the baby's learning how to how to handle objects pick stack blocks you know so if you were to use the kind of methods that say deep mind you you know the kind of these revolutionary methods of reinforcement learning i say you'd need to do that millions of times for that for that to for the learning to to converge which is just not practical in the real world with robots so what what you do instead is you you have real tactile data that you measure from your your fingertip from the artificial fingertip and then you have a simulated tactile sensor you know in the in the simulated world and then what you can do is try to collect that same data in the simulation so you've got kind of got a pair of of collected data in reality and collected data in the simulation and then that gives a map from kind of reality into simulation and simulation to reality but just on pairing up the tactile data and then in simulation you can you know you can learn any skill you can have a simulation of you know pouring pick stacking blocks or physics based simulations are really easy. That's, you know, what computer games do. So, you, you know, you can simulate these things and then you can learn how to do these things in simulation. And then say so you can bridge back into reality afterwards, but there's methods of sim to real. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you for answering the question. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it, I, I think it's going to become one of the dominant techniques in this area in the next five, 10 years. Um, it could be transformatory. Um, and you, you know, it's kind of a weird way of looking at it because you know you you kind of creating these simulations of the world, and then learning how to interact with the sim in in the simulation. But then, as I say, you can just then once it's learned, you can just map that straight back to reality, and, and it works first time on the robot. Uh, and at the moment, it's only kind of basic things they can do, you know, like feel around edges and kind of surfaces and stuff. But you know that that technology is going to going to advance. Um, but so. Uh, Bit of tangent. It's a bit different from from what we're going to talk about, which is um, which is the so the present work is on um, um, this kind of biometrics of touch. The our, our artificial tactile sensor that that we I say we I would like to work in a similar way to the human sense of touch and the work that we did on that. And particularly, this is worked on by uh, Nick Pestel, who was a PhD student with me 
uh, for several years. Um, and he, what he did is, is really connect together um, knowledge from, from biology about our, how our sense of touch works with, with um, the use of our robotic artificial skin kind of showing there's this kind of map, you can get a match between how, how a sense of touch works in biology and how this artificial sense of touch works. So that's what, what he did. And we published it in two papers recently, both in the Royal Society Interface, pair of papers. Um, and, um, on, and it's about artificial afferents, tactile sensing. So basically they're mechano, what afferents mean is it's, they're the nerve endings, if you like. They're, they're, they're the mechanoreceptors in the skin. So we're kind of saying artificial mechanoreceptors um, we, within these, you know, as I say, these artificial, uh, these artificial uh, tactile fingertips. Um, so to give a bit more, so we, were, so we were very lucky with, with this work in that because it was kind of, it was the first time that some, that group had compared an artificial tactile sensor to, to like the nerve signals coming from real skin. Uh, so it's both the first time it had been compared, but also the first time that a mark match had been found. Uh, and we did find a close match, as I'll, as I'll come to in a minute. Um, so we did a press, of course, because we've got the papers in the Royal Society as well, um, they, they have a very good press team. So we put out a press release and it kind of just ignited. And and we, we were covered, like hundreds of places covered this story. So we were very lucky. And it's the first time, first time it's ever happened to me that we got such a bit, lot of interest in our work, which which was fantastic. Um, in, in many ways, I learnt a lot actually myself from the kind of feedback I was getting when I was reading the articles that other people had wrote on our work. I, I learnt a lot from that myself. Um, uh, so that, yeah, that's slide ten. Uh, I'll try to speed up. <laughs> so um, I think so. Um, so the inspiration from the work was in the in the nineteen eighties. There were some classic papers on um, on how our sense of touch works. Um, where they were looking at um, basically like um, monkey fingertips uh, feeling different patterns such as like gratings and gaps and and bars and edges and they were measuring from the uh, neurons coming from the fingertips and, make, and mapping that back to to how the you know the shape of the sense shape of the uh, stimuli so doing a relationship between the nerve signals coming off and the shape of the stimuli. And, and there was, so these two couple of classic papers also published as a pair um, early in the 1980s. And that was really a, a kind of motivating uh, point for us to kind of replicate those studies with the artificial tactile sensor. Uh, and then we also took inspiration from other work on, on robot psychophysics uh, that came out a few years back, but didn't go as far as, as looking at the, the comparing the nerve signals, but did kind of, you know, make this point that you could do like psychophysics of, of robot touch. Uh, so that's slide 11. Um, so now in particular, so the key biometric feature of our, of our fingertip, our artificial fingertip is in, so in slide 12, um, you can see there's, there's at the bottom right, there's like a cut through of human skin. And basically between the, the top kind of outer stiff layer of skin called the epidermis, and the inner softer layer of skin, which has got like the, the blood vessels and um, the mechanoreceptors in it, um, there there are these structures, these uh, called dermal papillae, which are kind of like lots of kind of um, rods protruding from the epidermis into the dermis. So lots of papillae, kind of interdigitating between the two layers, and quite a complex structure. Um, and it's known that the mechanoreceptors in the human skin are found, uh, the shallow mechanoreceptors are found near those dermal papillae. So which indicates that there is, that those dermal papillae play a role in our, in our sense of touch. But it's not really known fully how, how they play a role in our sense of touch. So some people have, 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 have proposed that, you know, the key, that the, the movement of those papillae um, is what is picked up by the, uh, by the mechanoreceptors. But I say it's kind of still an open question in the biology. So, and what our artificial tactile fingertip does is um, we 3D print those same papillae structures, uh, which you can see in like the bottom E, slide E, bottom right of slide 12. We 3D print those papillae structures, but instead of using um, mechanic nerve sig nerve nerves to pick up the movement of them, we use a camera and we put little markers on the end of the papillae, and then the camera picks up the, the movements of the papillae. So we treat that movement of those 
artificial 3D printed papillae is the nerve signals that come out from our artificial fingertip. That's 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 what Nick did in this work. Um, so to get to give a bit, I'll, I'll quickly skip through these uh, time, but to give a bit more um, information about mechanoreceptors. So mechanoreceptors are the sensors in in skin that respond to mechanical stimulation by movement. Uh, there's basically four types in the human skin. Uh, there's what's known as shallow mechanoreceptors, uh, of which there's two types. One feels sustained contact, so like constant pressure. So they're called slowly adapting. And then there's a second population which feels uh, changes in contact, transient contact, which are called rapidly adapting. And then there's also uh, two types of deep mechanoreceptors that are found much deeper down. So they're not near the papillae, uh, but they're, they're deep under the skin and they kind of feel vibration and, and stretch. Um, so that's kind of the, the, you know, the biology of human skin, uh, you know, and then they've got various um, features like, you know, the, the shallow mechanoreceptors of small, high resolution, you know, they're kind of like there's a high resolution sensor touch, they have small receptive fields and they're quite dense, whereas the, the deeper ones that feel vibration are kind of a low resolution, you know, more sparsely populated. Um, uh, so that's slide 12, uh, 14, slide 15, just shows some examples of firing responses coming off them. So that, you know, these slowly adapting mechanoreceptors, which feel constant pressure. So they fire reasonably constantly when, when there's pressure happening and then turn off when there isn't. Whereas, you know, like the rapidly adapted mechanoreceptors, which feel changes in contact, they, you know, they fire rapidly when the, you know, when, the, when the change in pressure is happening, but, but then stop under constant pressure so they're just they're kind of signaling changes um so our model that we did to try and get these kind of artificial mechanoreceptors in our 3d printed tactile fingertip is basically we treated we we tracked the the motion of the pins for the markers on the ends and we just use some simple computer vision to track we kind of have a the the, the tac the images from the camera look like lots of spots like a kind of polka dot pattern from the markers on the ends of these papillae and then as the skin indents, those papillae move and we track these, the, the dots, the spots on the end of them with some computer vision algorithms and then get out signals of just of the of the, how much those papillae displace, uh, which we just treat as, you know, distance that they move. Uh, so this the, the slowly adapting activity, so the sustained activity, we treat it as just the displacement and the rapidly adapting activity we treat it as the velocity of the displacements or the speed of the displacements, how quickly something moves. Because, you know, if you, if you put a constant pressure on the sensor, the tips will move and then stay still. And well, that's kind of like the sustained activity. And you know, there's a constant displacement happening. Whereas um, as they move, that gives a transient signal, which is kind of like the rapidly adapting uh, uh, activity. So that was our model. Uh, and then basically we reconstructed um, the, the data, if you like, these kind of artificial SA, slowly adapting and rapidly adapting uh, mechanoreceptor activity as if they were neurons. And then we measured it under, I say, the same experiments as they did um, back in the early 1980s. So what is a, you know, a kind of constant press onto a plate and then releasing it? And so slide 17, you see the, the artificial uh, mechanoreceptor activity here. So this is for the artificial one, but if you look at plots of what it looks like from from humans from real skin, measuring the nerve signals, uh, the rate of firing, they actually look very similar to these. So this looks very reminiscent of of of, of actually of real recorded data from from a from a from a from a real from real skin. Uh, so that's the response to pressure. Uh, now the key response, kind of the smoking gun was this experiment 1B, uh, which is using these, we're using grating stimuli, which are kind of like, um, uh, so slide 18. And so these are kind of stimuli which are made from like ridges and then gaps between those. So these are gratings and these are aperiodic gratings. So they're varying the, the distance between the, the ridges. Um, and then what they did in the early 1980s in the, is that they looked at how strong the neural activity was coming off the fingertip as as the as the monkey uh, tapped its fingertip uh, systematically across these gratings, so that it was you know feeling like narrow gaps and then moving into wider gaps or wider ridges, um, and so we repeated that same experiment uh, with our artificial finger, and then plotted 
the artificial mechanical receptor activity as a comparison against those recordings from the monkey, from the real mechanical receptor activity from the eighties. And we found something that basically looked very similar uh, for both the slowly adapted and, and rapidly adapted. You look at the plots as I'm showing in the eighty, and it kind of looks reminiscent. Except the key difference is so maybe like say the A at the bottom is probably the closest match, so stimuli seven, where you can see the peaks and troughs are happening together with the blue and green curves. But the the biggest difference is um, the real skin is is more sensitive. So that's why you're seeing kind of, um, you can see that the real skin can kind of feel narrow gaps, but our artificial skin wasn't able to feel that. But it's basically because it's just not as sensitive as, as the real skin. But when it can feel it, it kind of acts in a, in a similar way. Uh, and then we did a third, a second experiment. What I'm going to do now in a minute is I'm going to skip over about five or 10 slides and not discuss the second paper in the interest of time. But I'll just, so this is the last kind of experiment I'll, I'll, I'll describe. Um, and then the, the other experiment was, um, so a kind of a, a classic test of how, of tactile acuity in, in humans and animals. Well, in, this is actually a human experiment in this case, is, is to, um, you, you look at periodic gratings, this on slide 19. So this is like a, a set of ridges with like distances between the ridges. And you can have really broad ridges, like corduroy, which is obviously really easy to feel. Um, and they're going down to really, really narrow ridges, which is which is less easy to tell that there's a ridge, that there's a grating pattern there. And then in the in the experiment, what they did is they randomly gave them at um, 90 degree orientations to each other and asked the participant to say which way, which orientation the grating was. And then the number of times they get it correct. So on the on the on the thick gratings, they get it correct almost all the time. They can tell which is whether it's a 90 degree, um, whether it's at 45 degrees or minus 45 degrees, the grating pattern. They can get that right, people can get that right all the time. But if you go down to like a one millimeter spacing, then people make lots of mistakes. And you get what's known as a psychophysical uh, curve for that, which I've shown on uh, slide 20. Uh, so I think the grey plots are from human participants who tried this. So that's the kind of psychophysical curves that they get. Uh, so we tried the same experiment and, beta, and, and with our artificial fingertip. And we, we built um, some kind of deep neural network ways of, in, of doing perception of the data, but tried to match it down, back to, how, to, the, to the psychophysics. To how to the how humans make judgments. So we use some some kind of classic work on on decision theory and how how perceptual judgments are made on stimuli. Um, and again, we found a match between our how the results coming off our sensor and um, and human and how humans um, behave on these on these tasks. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip the second paper now. In the interest of time, so I don't go on too long. Um, uh, but this is basically all about bringing the vibrator. The second paper is about bringing the vibrational sense into the into the sense of touch. Because I said there's the shallow mechanoreceptors that we're modelling, the slowly adapting and rapidly adapting. But what that misses is the deeper mechanoreceptors that feel vibration and human touch. So what we did in the second paper is we added um, uh, basically a microphone inside our tactile sensor and used that as a vibration sense. And then we, we did some experiments to show that you get a kind of a similar behavior. But I'm going to skip over that. So I'm going to skip forward to slide 26, where I'll just make some comments. So I say, but, but, but so to summarize, so paper one, we showed there's this match between um, SA1 and uh, SA and RA, mechanoreceptor activity in artificial and, and our, in our artificial tactile fingertip and real skin. Uh, first time such a match has been looked for, and you know, the first time it's found, nobody's looked for it before. Um, gives evidence that these dermal papillae really are involved in the sensing, because that was the key mechanical structure of our artificial skin that we copied from the real skin. Um, that this whole, whole you know, exercise does not work for, and it, so that gives us confidence that we're kind of in the, going along the right track with this with this um, technology. And then I say the second paper. It's about you know the vibration sense, which is also important to human touch and also fits with our technology. 
And there's a load of open questions, such as what fingerprints are for, differences between human touch and biometric skin. Um, and also, as I said, the, the skin, we found one of the differences between our 3D printed skin and real skin was that it wasn't as sensitive. So that gives a question, how, how then do you make it more sensitive? Um, so I can finish that, but I'm just going to say a couple of last words um, on something. I, th I think this maybe will appeal to the audience because it's, you know, this is on sort of uh, social responsibility in, in robotics. Um, or maybe, so I've got a few more slides on social responsibility in robotics, which I can go into, or I could just take questions now instead. So I don't know, what, what would be better? Oh yeah, please go ahead, I think. And then, and then we go to the question. Thank you. Okay, so social responsibility in robotics. So um, I take open research. I think open research is very important um, for, for many reasons from, you know, repeatability of what other people do to just enabling other people to, to benefit and to develop research that other labs have done. And so, you know, I, I opened up the software that we used and the data. But there's so in many areas, like say AI, it's kind of it's easier to do open research because you can just make your code available, you make your data available, and somebody else can download that code and download that data, and you know they're ready to go. Um, and I, in neuroscience as well, open research is very important too. And so there, you know, people make the data sets available for other labs to do. And usually, all the all the equipment they use is off the shelf. Um, so, you know, it's relative in those cases, you know, in some sense, the experiments are repeatable by other labs, although no, I, I know that can be difficult as well. So the issue in robotics is that as well as needing a, the, the difference from AI, as well as needing the code and the data, uh, you also need the robots. And um, robots can be, A, very expensive and dangerous. For example, if you use an industrial robot arms, as we did in this research there, you know, £20,000 each have to be installed by highly, highly trained technicians they have to be screened off because if they hit somebody, it could really hurt some people. So and also so that gives a kind of access and also a lot of the technology, such as the tactile sensing technology, is not not easily available to buy. So that gives an accessibility issue where um, other labs have difficulty getting that hardware to repeat the work and to develop it. Um, and also, could it, I think because, you know, this area of robot dexterity is obviously of a high economic importance as well, you know, that could could cause the field to go towards, you know, basically private research labs with lots of money are the ones making the advances in this area because they, you know, can have critical mass and the resources to do it, which I think is a danger. You know, it's supposed like Amazon was to own all robot dexterity technology. You know, is that a future we would necessarily want? So democratizing robot touch, I see, is important for the field. And I, I mean, this is a few slides. Maybe I won't go through it in detail, but just basically this is all about trying to make our tactile sensor technology, because it's 3D printed, it's easy to make and, and, and um, develop for other labs as possible. That's what this is about. So it's, it's combining the benefits of 3D printing so that other labs can easily make the, t the t technology and combining that with open release of code an open release of the data and just trying to be as open as possible and trying to make the research as accessible to other labs as possible. So, um, so there's a few slabs, slides here. So, we, you know, there's there's some Digitac, which is an open source tactile sensor that we've developed recently uh, using low cost robot arms to do the research on. So um, our, all our recent papers, we've been using low cost arms, which cost about a thousand or two thousand pounds when we can. Uh, and they're safe as well because they're quite small, but they're, this is an area which is really rapidly advancing as well, and that this new technology coming coming out, which is which is very which is which is rivaling these more expensive industrial robotics arms in in their capabilities. Um, slide thirty one. Let's say we've done some work on the Cinterreal that I was mentioning earlier, using these kind of low cost platforms on these low cost robotic arms with these open sensors again to kind of democratize this this technology. And then also, you know, slide 32, another thing, a development we've done in my lab is we've built, um, there's an anthropomorphic um, robot hand that's very well known in the field called the soft hand, uh, that mainly, mainly at the moment you can buy as a commercial hand, but we've developed a low cost 3D printed version of it. Um, also working with the people who developed 
the hand originally as well. So that's that's another way of democratizing the field so that, you know, for a few hundred pounds, you can build a state of the art robot hand. Uh, so last slide, 33. So for accessible robot dexterity, I see it all about open data, open hardware, open software, and an open attitude as well, I think is the most important. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Hope I didn't drone on too long there. <laughs> really <laughs> love <lovely. Thank laughs> you. Where did you get that slide from? <laughs> that was amazing. I was loving it. Sorry. <laughs> that's so amazing, Katarina. <laughs> oh, that's true. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your work, Nathan, with us. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of us on stage and also some of our newcomers have a lot of questions. So let's see, Katarina, do you have any questions? Serena, Jamie, we'll start with you. Well, sure. So I'll start off. A fascinating talk and a very fascinating area. And it's so great to see. I, I certainly applaud your open attitude about in developing it because uh, so much of the good stuff is, you know, secret sauce to secret places. Um, I'm curious uh, first about the scalability. You've got the 3D, 3D printed technologies and it's, in, it's certainly fascinating to um, look at the human hand and you know what types of you know the myriad of applications that we could do um but in terms of the things that we couldn't do because of scale so are have you looked at um how small or how large you could scale up that tactile sense for you know different applications at different length scales well, that's an interesting question um so the work at the moment in, in my lab, I mean, we mainly focus on the human hand scale because, you know, but that's what we're trying to mimic in a sense. And, you know, the kind of unsolved, quite, you know, the robot dexterity is still a far way off from human dexterity. As in, it's kind of, you know, the, I, I don't know, there's the cliche that, you know, you know, you can have an AI systems that beat human players at chess. But we're still not at the stage where a robot can reliably pick up a chess piece and move it across a board. You know, so it's a it's a it's a very it's completely unsolved problem, uh, or, or partially mm -hmm. unsolved problem. So I so say we're focusing on that kind of core core capability of the dexterity and giving a sense of touch. But I would say, in principle, once you've got a handle on that, once you can figure out how to make the, the sensors that that give the right information and how to train robots so that they can do those dexterous things pick up the chess pieces and so on then I, I see no reason why you can you're certainly making it bigger that's 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 it's easier i mean the challenge is actually making it small to the size of a human hand that's, mm -hmm. that's the challenge so making mm -hmm. it bigger is no problem at all um making it smaller is more challenging i would say interesting and um and in terms of the Yes, yeah, sir. Certainly, there's the you know the control system issues, which you know those go deep. Yeah. But in terms of the actuation, then, um, do you, do you feel that I mean it's almost as though this is pushing ahead of our ability for fine tactile act actuation? Do you feel advances um, in actuation, soft actuation, and fine control mm. are are on par? Or um, any comments well, about? You know that well there are differences of views in the field on this so as you said there's there's people who are into into soft actuation so soft robotics so that that would be trying to say replicate you know like human muscle or get you know our muscles are soft mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. trying to get capabilities that are more like that so that that is a completely on that's you know that's a that's a challenging problem that's still unsolved but I would say in terms of, you know, having a tendon driven hand or using, you know, robot arms with motors in, motors are extremely reliable technology. You can make them very small, very powerful. I would say it, it's there already. And in fact, ro industrial robot arms are more accurate than, than, than human sensor, human control. As in, you can get like micron level accuracy with those systems or tens mm -hmm. of microns at least. So I, I would say the actuation, it depends which view you take, but if you want to kind of a classic um, robot 
control perspective, then the, the actuation is there. But what's known is what's not known is, is the algorithms to then control, you know, to control those robots in a in a kind of right, interactive right. way with the with the real world. Right. And so, uh, yeah, just as a final question for me, um, in terms of that, the whole sensory control actuation loops, um, yeah. it'd be interesting to hear your comments on where we are in the field for, you know, perceiving and then um, planning, you know, more these more complex um, techniques. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that, that's the unsolved problem. Yeah. The sensory motor loop. Yeah, it's, it's not known how to do that in robotics, apart from on very basic tasks. Um, so the work we've done, because it's not even known how to do it without planning. Um, so the work we've done has been on, you know, control, I say without planning, where it's just reactive control that, you know, you might be trying to feel over a complex shape and keep the fingertip, you know, feeling it delicately and staying kind of normal perpendicular to the surface as it moves as it slides over a surface or you know pushing an object around um so keeping in contact with it or you know maybe molding an object or, or, or deforming it squeezing it so those those kind of non-planning based tasks i say are getting well we we can do that now using deep learning um and so they are getting solved Fling and planning into that as well. I mean, because it's not even known how to do the reactive tasks fully, you know, there's not so much done on the planning, um, apart from in um, robot vision. So a lot of robot manipulation and robot dexterity work, the vast majority um, actually uses vision, not touch. Uh, so touch is very much a minority field. And in vision, then planning is really important. And, and a lot is known there, you know, that people know how to guide arms to in a way that they can plan to like move around obstacles. Um, and so on. Thank you. Fascinating. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nathan, for that. Um, Jamie, you have any questions? Um, I had one that's a, a, a kind of curious one, really, right? So this is incredibly fascinating. That, that is an amazing talk. And I actually really, really enjoyed um, your social responsibility um, oh. talk after it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that seems really, really important in something like this. Um, what I was wondering is, um, at the moment, are you more just kind of seeing if it can be done, or do you have any like applications for this? Because um, I'm thinking of how and when um, tactile uh, stuff for these machines might be kind of useful, right? And um, I'm I'm thinking there could be applications, but ones that people would maybe not like welcome. Yeah, I was thinking of stuff yeah, like true. like that hand that gives massages and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, have you got any thoughts on that? Well, I, I tend to have more of a focus on the industrial side of things. So there, I mean, you know, the big the big research institution, you know, Google, Amazon, Dyson. You know, these will all have um, large labs working on robot dexterity where, to a large extent, we don't actually know what they're doing. Um, but they're doing it because, you know, there are, you know, concrete applications of, of the technology. So, for, like, say, Dyson, you know, they're quite open that they're working on these technologies because they want to have domestic robots, you know, so an extension of vacuum cleaners, but instead something that can pick up, you know, stuff around your house, tidy your house or, or um, you know, or load your dishwasher, so on. So they, they see these as big areas. Um, Amazon is interested in it because it could transform the logistics industry. At the, at the moment, a lot of packaging, a lot of packing in, you know, supermarket warehouses and, and say, Amazon is actually done by people because robots don't have the skill to be able to, you know, put things reliably into boxes and bags. So that they, they for sure have got programs where they're, they're trying to automate that. So they could have all completely automated warehouses or supermarkets, you know, getting goods to your door. So they, you know, they, and these are big economically important um, problems to solve. Um, so I guess in relation, relation to the open access of the technology is to my, my feeling, so I feel that the technology could have a lot more broader benefits uh, that might not necessarily have so 
obvious and economic impact at first, but still are nevertheless important to to do. So I, I think recycling is an important one. You know, just you know, the, the, being able to with recycling is basically down to sorting out different materials from each other so that you're able to, you know, recycle cardboard or, you know, extract valuable materials from it. At the moment, it's all done by hand, you know, a lot of it by people. And then they find out that a lot of it's actually just burnt. Whereas if you could have robots that are able to do that, that could really transform recycling, and really make a difference, I think. And then there's other applications, you know, assistive robotics and help people. But the, I think some, some of these ones that don't have big, big economic benefits, but are still societally important, can only really happen if the technology is accessible so that people can, you know, get something that works maybe as a trial and then develop it themselves into, you know, a viable technology for, for assistive living or, or for recycling. And so that's that's why I really think this kind of, you know, low cost, um, democratized way of open way of doing the research is important because it enables other people to then take that technology and develop it into something that's that's of benefit when there might not necessarily be a, a clear economic case for it um, to start with. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm totally with you there. That's actually fascinating. Yeah, there the, the really is quite a lot of possibility. It's, it's just, it's such a strange thing, eh? You know, like, I mean, it's something that everybody would pursue to see about um, giving like touch skin and everything. It's just, it's one of those things that's like, how can we use touch? You don't think of touch, right? Sight makes sense. Sound makes sense. And you have to kind of go, what would you use touch for? <laughs> Thank you for asking my question. As, as my questions. Thanks. Yeah. Well, th but the answer is any, anything we use our hands for, we, you know, robot hands could could be able to do that as well if they had a proper sense of touch. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for answering that. And Jamie, thanks for that question. Um, we have some people on stage, so I'm going to go to Ali. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, hey, Katrina, thanks a lot for the opportunity. And thanks, uh, Nathan, uh, for your great talk. It's really amazing. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, I remember uh, one of our uh, colleagues at MIT in the Department of uh, Computer Science, uh, they, uh, they developed a soft hand um, from, as I remember, silicone rubber. Yeah, in their system or in their developed um, hand, fingers had um, sensors which could detect the shape and size of, size of the objects. And also, it could detect the material. I'm not sure about how it was able to detect the material. And just I would like to know, uh, for example, um, in your developed system, uh, how this kind of uh, selecting objects or uh, uh, interacting with objects, picking them up, uh, work. Or also, it um, can detect materials or not. Or if yes, uh, how it works. Uh, so I know there's a few kind of soft hands out there in the in the field, um, and I say we work on soft hands ourselves. Um, the the piece of IIT soft soft hand <clears throat> that was developed by um, Antonio Beaky originally. Um, so in if it if it's feeling kind of shape of an object or or you know compliance. You can you can get a lot of that information from proprioceptive information, which is basically you know the, how much the motors have moved um, on on the hand. So basically the, the pose of the how, how much the fingers have moved. You can get a lot of information that way. So it's possible that that soft hand from MIT used the proprioceptive information. Um, now in terms of like the roughness and the texture of materials, that would require a sense of touch, but that can be also be done from a vibrational sense. Um, um, now, for for dexterous manipulation of objects in hand, so that, you know tool use or handling an ob a fine motor control of an object, um, what you need is a high resolution tactile sense. So you need you know a lot of spatial, high resolution spatial information about the contact, in order that you can do fine control of that contact. Um, so it's, I would suspect the, the hand that you're talking about doesn't have that, that sense in it, because I said there's only a few labs that, that work on this. Um, 
And um, I say that's that's the novel one of the you know kind of selling points of our tactile sensor that it does have that high resolution sense. That I say I think I see is key for for dexterous manipulation. Okay, awesome. And uh, you talked also about uh, you talked about contact. Um, so uh, between the uh, you know the uh, different parts of the finger, uh, we yeah. have um, you know we have contact and uh, <clears throat> sorry. And in those areas or in the contacting areas, we have friction, and it yeah. may result in adhesion. Um, yeah. So have you also considered this kind of failure? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this, okay. uh, this is a good technical question. Yes, yeah, so um, what one of the so evolutionary speaking, in terms of our human our human hands, the human sense of touch, one of the key capabilities we have is um, feeling uh, frictional information and also detecting slippage. So if you like, a function of our hand is, is when we're holding objects, we don't want to drop them as well. And you can see why that's important, you know, evolutionary, because like, you know, Imagine like monkeys and trees or something picking apples. You don't want to drop the apple. So having this kind of capability to detect when an object is about to um, lose, is, is about to slip, when you're about to lose your grip or an object is about to slip, which basically comes down to frictional properties, is really key. Um, so it just turns out that one, one of the, so the rapidly adapting sensors, the mechanoreceptors I was talking about earlier, Turns out that they they use are key for detecting slip, and our sensor just the mechanism of it, of it amplifies slip detection. So we have, we have a number of papers on this where actually it just turns out from the although the sensor was designed originally for things like edge detection, when we tried tried it on slip detection and kind of feeling friction test, it worked really effectively at that. As and we think that's basically down to we were copying how human skin works, and human skin is very effective at, at feeling slip. Okay, um, great. And uh, I have two more questions. One uh, okay. gets back to the structure and the other one gets back to the properties. Yeah. Um, uh, um, so we have a, um, an approach called ICME and in the frame of ICME, we try to develop uh, process uh, structure property performance relationships. Um, uh, and also for AI, uh, uh, um, so I, I'm talking from the engineer, uh, uh, material science yeah. physics. Side, not from a um, uh, robotic side. Um, so we try to control, uh, we can develop, even if you go to the data driven based models or you know AI models, uh, what you also developed. Um, we, we, we can have, uh, for example, this, um, we can develop our models uh, where the input comes from process and the quantity of stress, uh, uh, quantity of interest comes from the property. Uh, or we can develop a multi-scale model, uh, multi-scale, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's a good uh, or correct word here or not, or uh, multiple scale model, like uh, creating a relationship between process, structure, property. And from yeah. there, we can see how we can control the, you know, for example, our three different uh, parameters to be able to control, for example, the structure, as you mentioned, it should uh, uh, be very high, uh, we should have a very high resolution, you know. Uh, yeah. in the structure and also from the other side, uh, the property of interest. Um, so in, in your work also, have you developed such a relationship between these uh, three steps or uh, only you consider process prop, prop, uh, pro, uh, property or structure property? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, very curious to, uh, to know uh, how it worked. Okay, I, well, so I'm, not, I'm not so familiar with, you know, process theory. Um, um, okay, so is, is this, do you mean this is, is this in terms of designing? Do yeah, like for example, hatch spacing, heat input, energy, uh, uh, that, that's what I mean. The velocity of nozzle. Oh, I see, for the 3D printing. Or oh, we just use the 3D printers as, 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 you know, it's kind of standard. I mean, we have quite an expensive 3D printer, a Stratasys multi-material 3D printer, so it can do both soft and hard materials. But we don't, you know, go go beyond you know the standard use of that printer okay i see so that answers your question i mean we i mean we don't have the expertise to do that or, or actually we don't need to do it as well because we're with the printy printers we have they, they they you know produce the accuracy and the kind of prints that we we, we want okay good yeah i i think it's uh, it it can help a lot 
Um, yeah. And the last question is about the properties. Uh, you talked about pressure, stretching. Um, just uh, my question is, the, when you are talking about the pressure, is it hydrostatic pressure or you are talking about compressive strain? Uh, because in, in, in hydrostatic pressure, everything will be in the elastic zone, so the, uh, then uh, we will be safe. But if we go to the uniaxial, like compressive strain or uh, plain strain or biaxial, we will have also permanent deformation and it might not be that uh, good for, you know, uh, uh, for the safety and functionality of the, uh, the hand, and uh, we may get some failure. Uh, this is one, and the second is, um, uh, uh, have you done also any physics-based simulation to study the properties? And the third one, uh, also have you considered impact loading or uh, thermal uh, loading in your system uh, because of the temperature changes in the environment? Uh. So there was three questions. So the, the, the <laughs> Sorry, <middle>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I tried to put all in one question. Know, <laughs> so on, on modeling it, um, yes, we do do some modeling of it. Um, it's actually very challenging to model um, uh, contact dynamics for these. So, so you can do simple models that do things just like um, indentation. Uh, that's fairly straightforward in, you know, the Pi bullet we use for that, but there's also more sophisticated um, simulators. Uh, what is really challenging is shear force um, um, in these did things. You, and did you the just, excuse me, did you just console uh, answers, Abacus, or you wrote your own codes for that? We've got some work which we've been doing recently using ANSYS, I think it's called, um, but we haven't used COMSOL. Okay. Um, but I'd say the sim to real work all uses uh, Pi bullet. But that doesn't, you know, have very good contact modeling in it. Um, so we, we do some stuff for validating the sensors. We haven't done a huge amount of that, but we've done some. But I say most of it we use for the sim to real stuff because we have to use physics based simulators for that. Um, um, and then your other uh, questions were sorry. about the impact deformation and also about uh, temperature effect. Uh, temperature, I mean, you know, we don't, something we don't really pay attention. I mean, the, the sensors work very accurately, as in just under uncontrolled conditions in terms of temperature, just in the lab, we can get down to like tens of microns, like accuracy for, for, for feeling, um, you know, for feeling pose of objects or shape of objects. So, um, and we can even, one of the tests we've done recently, we can, I don't know, but like ultrasound, hapt, um, is an ultrasound for haptics. We were able to map ultrasound fields, which only deflect the, the sensor by, you know, a few microns. We we're able to detect that. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, because when the robot works in, in cold So, so uh, Ali, we could possibly come back, but why don't we give sure, yeah, I'm done. Okay. yeah, I'm done. Just I have a, a quick suggestion that's, uh, that's I'm done. Um, so about the console, console is uh, developed for linear problems, and if you look for nonlinear problems, uh, I, I suggest to move to Abacus or Answers, just as the last suggestion. And thanks, Dr. Nathan, yeah. for your uh, to, yeah. for your answers, and best of luck. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, cheers. I think we are using Answers. One of the PhD students has, has been, I mean, it wasn't my idea, but he, he, so I, I mean, you're absolutely right there, I think. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nathan, for answering those questions. Um, so next we got Arvin. Cheers, uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, no, your audio sounds weird. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Yes. Okay, cheers, thank you. Uh, so I just have two questions. The first question is, what are the uncertainties that you encountered when designing or modeling this stuff? Uncertainty in the sense, say, for example, if I am designing a wind turbine, uh, the velocity is an uncertain factor. Uh, we don't know what the wind speed is going to be, right? So with, uh, in yeah. accordance to that, what are the uncertainties that you kind of model, but you didn't have any choice to sort of nullify them or avoid them at all? So uncertainties. Um, uh, uh, right. Good. Okay. So so okay. Uh, just to add more context, say for example, uh, uh, if you want to determine the fatigue or the life life of the sort of three D printed hand that 
you have designed so what would you go on about right yeah i mean we're still at, i mean i would say we're at kind of trl3 so we, we're not necessarily you know trying to develop these things as a, as a product so you know life i mean in terms of the lifetime of the sensors generally we break one ourselves by having an accident with them I, I sat on one the other day and broke it. <laughs> then, then, when, then the wear and tear on on the sensors. Um, so, I, I mean, in terms of the uncertainties, I mean, I would say the, the actual the uncertainty is is the nature of the stimulus, because you know our, our sense of touch it can feel such a wide variety of of, of thing. You know, it's almost like a visual sense in our fingertips. So, you know. The completely unconstrained nature of contact, I would say, is the biggest uncertainty. If that answers your question. Yeah, right. Um, yep, yeah, yeah, that definitely does. Uh, coming to the second question, which is, which sort of derives from your answer, right? Uh, by any chance, uh, uh, when when it comes to sort of like making the hand feel uh, different surfaces or profiles, uh, yeah. did you and your team get in? That's with, say, a metrology department to, to get an overview or an analog of how profiles work and how to characterize them. Yeah, so this, this as you're, you're absolutely right that this area is very close to metrology. Uh, so that's measuring um, things. Um, so we, we have looked at that and we have been in contact with companies that do metrology. Um, one, one of our, uh, I wouldn't say competitors, I would say, you know, kind of one of our colleagues other groups in the field who works on the closely related area is, is known as the gel site group that's mit so they also have um, an optical tactile sensor that uses a camera in it that's high resolution um but it's not biometric it's, it works more like the the the, the human vision but works more like vision whereas i say ours is high resolution but works is biometric it works more like human sense but so the gel site sensor uh, which I say is developed at MIT around the same time as our sensor. Um, so Meta, you know, Facebook Meta, they have a team of about 10 people who are developing that as well. So, that, you know, there's a lot of interest in that technology. Um, and Gelsite is a company. Uh, their principal application is actually in metrology because um, people buy it to get very, very precise measurements of um, contact shape. Uh, but I say our, our sensor, we haven't really looked at that application of it. We kind of leave it to the gel site people. Our application is more towards, I say, robot dexterity. Right, cheese. Yep, that answers the question. Yeah, and yeah, it was a wonderful uh, talk, and I thank the panel for having me. Cheese, thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arvin. Um, finally, we have Eli. Hi, Eli. Hi. Thank you. So. Um... Uh, I didn't realize that collision avoidance was still uh, such a problem, especially to the level of being uh, a safety issue. Um, I'd kind of like to suggest uh, a different biomimetic uh, approach, um, putting a piezo uh, electric uh, um, sensor whiskers <laughs> along things. Um, because uh, uh, it works pretty well for cats. Um, and uh, similarly, as a person with body hair, I have I have noticed that, <laughs> uh, um, like when I'm doing like close order manipulation work, just the feedback from like hair on the back of my fingers or, or the back of my hand can can help like you know know where I am when I can't see what I'm doing. So just so, a couple uh, of suggestions there. Well, I agree with you entirely. I mean, I say my background was I used to work on biometric whiskers. That I, I had a, a postdoc for a couple of years working on biometric whisker technology. So, you know, I completely agree with you. And it's kind of things have their uses. So, I mean, you there, you focused on, you know, collision detection um, so, uh, and proximity sensing as well, which I'd say you wouldn't you wouldn't use the sense the technology we use as, as a collision detector or as a proximal sensor. It's a fingertip. So it, it's there. It's uses for dexterous manipulation and for holding objects. Um, if you want a proximity sensor or a collision detector, you either go for a skin, a tactile skin, which is a different technology where, you know, as you say, like the, you can have piezo resistive skins, you know, the, the surfaces of our iPhones, which we're probably all grabbing now, that's a tactile sensor that's, I think, capacitive technology. So, you know, there's tactile skins, you would use that for contact detection. 
Or as you say, you could cover things in whiskers. Or there's other ways of doing proximal sensing as well. As well. You can use, you know, infrared and so on. Uh, but I agree. But say the point of our technology is, is it's not a skin. It's, it's not a whisker. It's a fingertip. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I, I was more thinking for, for uh, like, um, in the context of applications like assistive robotics, for example. So if, if you had like a robot arm that maybe had fur or something that could, uh, could uh, detect, you know, the, the, the weak contact, you can avoid like hard contact. Yeah, I agree entirely. Yeah, I, I say, but it's a different problem from what I work on. That's about um, making your robot safe. Uh, around people if you've got a, a robot arm and, there, and you know there's many technologies there from as you say contact detection but some the more advanced robot arms now they have very sensitive force torque sensors in the joints and so they're able to have what's called active compliance as well so if you knock into them they can rapidly feel that somebody's knocked into it and then become more compliant which is another technology um, so th i mean there's multiple technologies for solving this 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 safety problem as I say, my, 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 my focus is on dexterity and fingertips and hands. It's a, it's a slightly different problem. Um, uh, but can I agree you add like, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Can you add LiDAR technology for the safety option? Because Yeah, well, vision. Yeah. As you say, vision, there's no where things are in a scene. I mean, that's kind of right. It's getting the right technology for the problem, as, as you say. Yeah, LiDAR, vision. Um, you probably need nested technologies, so vision to get a feel of the scene, and it's, or LiDAR to get, you know, uh, depth maps to know where things are in the scene, coupled with some sort of skin or, as, as Eli was saying, proximity sensing. So, you know, if the vision fails and the robot's about to hit something, uh, to have that to detect when it's going about to happen, you know, with active compliance on the robot as well, in the motors so that it can detect and react. Or, you know, soft robotics as well as thing we were talking about earlier, soft muscles, you know, they, 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 they help safety as well because, you know, the compliance of the, of the robot itself makes it safer around people. Yeah, if I can ask a question. So, um, are you planning or are you, maybe somebody asked a question. I'm sorry, I had to drop <laughs> off for a few minutes and come back. Um, are you using this technology or applying this for paralyzed people? Because, you know, I follow Miguel Nicolili's lab's work with exoskeletons work and, you know, there was very surprising um, development that not just it helped people um, to have like good sensors on the feet, for example, it didn't yeah. just help people have better control, but actually people regained some slight um, control over um, you know their motoric system um, after like being paralyzed for 15 years so it's quite exciting so um, that's one question and then the other question is do you think that soon maybe the robotic hands will be better even than the yeah. actual hands by adding like I don't know you could have add sense of smell or detector <laughs> of some maybe some explosives you know you have like you can have the adams family hand walk around <laughs> and, and feel their way if there's something toxic or you know like <laughs> something like that mines um. that'd be awesome <laughs> <laughs> fantastic uh, yeah yeah fantastic so two quick like, so i deal I'll, I'll answer the first one, which is on uh, rehabilitative technologies and um, exoskeletons. Um, yeah, and, and for sure, you know, I, I agree entirely. So a lot of people in the robot hand um, area focus on um, prosthetic hands to replace, you know, become a Luke Skywalker hand or something. So I personally think that is it's missing. So the bigger problem, as, as you've rightly said, stroke. You know, there's not that many people with, with missing hands and limbs compared to the millions, tens or hundreds of millions of people who've had stroke and have got um, loss of function in a limb or in, you know, half of their body or or, or even up to paralysis, you know, like um, cr chronic injury uh, causing paralysis. And, and you're absolutely right that, um, you know, there's, there's studies that show that if people can have rehabilitative technologies that, for example, 
might, um, as they try to move their arm, but maybe they haven't got enough strength to move their arm, but they have an assistive uh, robot that can then move their arm, but under their volition, but is kind of helping them. And it helps them um, recover from, from, from these injuries, uh, from stroke. So it's a really important technology, in my view. And um, fundamentally, I think that, you know, the, so the technologies are, are getting there, but they're still quite primitive. And fundamentally, what, what's needed is for those exoskeletons to be able to feel the motion of, of a human and, and move with it. You know, it's kind of like if we were to hold, you know, human uh, people doing rehabilitation, uh, you know, um, um, I forgot the name of this, physiotherapists, you know, they might help. They might hold the person's limb and guide them as they're trying to rehabilitate them. Um, so I think that technology could be game changing. And you and it's another dexterous manipulation problem so that you have a robot that can act safely with with a with a person and that how and act as a kind of robot physiotherapist. And, you know, I do say that as an implication of this type of technology. And that's one of the kind of examples earlier where there may not be a huge economic um, initial economic benefit for it, but there will be people who are highly motivated to try and tackle these problems if if the technology is available to them. So yeah, I, I do see that as really important. Um, so and then the second question was: Can robot hands be better than human hands? Well, as you say, I mean, there's I think there's ways that people can think of. You know, if, once technology is available for people to experiment with, they can think of you know ideas that you know I could never imagine or roboticists could never imagine. Who, to make them better but in terms of the capabilities of, of of robots anyway so you know our human our sensory motor loop from you know tactile sensation to our brain interpreting that that information and then sending it back to our muscles to move is rough takes roughly 100 milliseconds um yeah, so that's quite a slow uh, feedback loop uh robots can operate on a millisecond you know, they're a hundred times faster in that in how they can you know process process um, and control. So, so I see. I think that what they will quickly once you're able to get this artificial dexterity of human like uh, human like levels, it will quickly just go past what we're capable of, just because the machines are so so much more powerful and can be so much faster and responsive than 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 our own you know limited um, you know motor systems. Another artist field going down the drain. <laughs> Piano players, violin players. <laughs> there was a I, just to I just totally thought piano. <laughs> just as you were talking about that, I was still thinking piano. We can we can now compose maybe five hands, uh, <laughs> and like attach them. And the brain that's the best at integrating five hands will win the competition. <laughs> absolutely. Such so humans couldn't even play. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I would hope that humans would at least be able to be, you know, there'd be something more human about how we um, how we play an instrument, and I hope that would be that would be possible to still hear. Hopefully. <laughs> well, but it can be a... really. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I I did have a, a follow up question. You um. You you gave such kind words about the openness. I'm wondering for the the home enthusiast, you know, the uh, Raspberry Pi, Arduino folks, um, how would they approach, uh, you know, adopting your sort of starter kit or, or getting a ha getting a hold of some of the advances that you've made, and um, start looking at, you know, novel control systems for this technology. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, I spent most of this week tidying up stuff to put on GitHub. Um, all the CADs, all the software, because uh, it's something. I mean, it's been actually hard work from my from my own perspective, just trying to bring these things together. Uh, but I do strongly believe in it, so I put a lot of work in it. So I say it's all there. It's on GitHub. Somebody can download it. Somebody can install the software. Somebody can. Uh, if you don't have a, a really good three D printer, there's you can send them off by mail order. You can get stuff three D printed by mail order that costs like maybe twenty pounds or something and delivered. So it's possible to do all this from from the home, and actually, I in lockdown I bought a load of equipment so that I could do this myself just to test this out, and I've managed to go through all the steps myself. Um, and now, in terms of like investigating the robot control, I mean, so the robots we're using now these Dubot robots, uh, which stands for desktop robot, that are made in in China, 
you can buy one of those for a thousand pounds uh, and a really good one for a couple of thousand pounds. And I say, we, we can do state of the art in terms of the search that's state of the art in our lab, we can do it on those. Yeah. So for a few couple of thousand pounds, you can kind of get everything that we, we use in our labs for publishing our, our most recent papers. Um, now I realize that's still a couple of thousand pounds. So it's not democratizing it maybe for the, for the home, market um, possibly for the educational market it fits but for, for the home home enthusiast but there's a there's a big home maker community in making robot arms as well so the, the designs up for you know a couple hundred pounds people make robot arms using raspberry pies and you know laser cutting bits of wood or, or plastic to do it so there's a huge maker community in it i, I would see this as completely compatible with that maker community because it's all off the shelf stuff or things that can be just made by a 3d printer uh, may I ask, um, uh, you were talking about um, maybe having to look at how we make the skin and everything more, uh, more sensitive and um, wondered, like, how do you think that could happen? And I was even wondering, do you think this might actually lead into giving it its own sort of, um, uh, what do you call it, a neuro system, neurological yeah. system? Well... I mean, so we've got ideas ourselves about how to make it more sensitive and one being just basically printing it at a finer resolution. You know, the, the dermal papillae in our artificial skin are, are a lot bigger than the ones in real skin. So we're currently just pushing at trying to make the skin thinner, 3D printed skin thinner with the smaller structures in it in the hope that that will give um, more sensitivity. And we expect it will. But I think, you know, there's room out there, if, you know, if other people can try these things and, and innovate, I think there's a more, there's room for more innovative ways of doing it that, you know, we could imagine in our lab, but, you know, other people, people could look at it in a different way. Absolutely. So much potential. Thank you so much. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, I have another, you know, Thank crazy you. weird, but it would be an interesting, also ba basic research um, question. Did you ever or think of attaching these, let's say a hand, you know, with five fingers to a rat and see if they, yeah. you know, their neural system can take, because I'm thinking of this because Miguel Nicolilisi took like infrared um, sensors and um, hooked them up to a mouse brain and the mouse brain was perfectly fine uh, taking care of that sensory input additionally to their regular whisker um, sensory input so it would be really interesting if they would be able to like use a hand like we use and then we have rats running around being able to flush the toilet <laughs> <laughs> well, we wouldn't need robots around the hands around the houses then um, so what's my view on this because i have kind of thought about some of these, these things so but my fear, so there are experiments being done in 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 states where you've got monkey you know direct neural implants um, electrodes into monkey brains and the monkeys um being able to control like robot arms um from just directly from from these uh, you know from these event invasive electrodes um so for sure you can do this kind of neural interfacing um my feeling is, um, you know, rats would be good at rat-like things. So for feeling things that are, you know, feeling enclosed spaces and, you know, going down little tunnels and rusting around kind of things, the kind of things they use their whiskers for, they'd, they'd be really good at that. If you've got other sen And if you've got other sensory information that's a bit like whisker information coming in, then they'd maybe be able to be make use of that and do things. I don't think they'd be able to use hands. I think for that, you basically, you're going to need an animal that's already got hands. So you're up to kind of basically monkeys um, are, are, you know, the primates, you know, they, they, they've they evolved to to make use of their hands. And so you're going to need an animal of that that kind I've of, had... you know, with hands to make sense. Of it. That's my, yeah. that, but that's just a hunch. I'm, I, right. I'm not sure so. because the infrared signal, the mice were able to, um, to accurately, um, you know, their cortex was able to accurately use that information um, and then sense like, um, you know, whenever an infrared signal would come, when they would, they would press a lever or whatever and get like a reward yeah. and, and they were very accurate in using that information. So apparently, you know, the, the cortex is able, it's kind of this very structured 
it's kind of like a simplified algorithm can, that can like uh, c calculate a lot of stuff, not just it's the input is basically restricting the cortex, not really um, that the infrastructure of the cortex is restricting what inputs they can take care of. At least that's one of the results I think it points towards. So, so it would be just really interesting to have like maybe a finger for now. <laughs> Well, be well, cool. well, I agree. So a finger, yeah, I, I think, I mean, you're talking, you know, sort of sensory cortex. So this, and I agree entirely, they could, they could make sense probably of, of the, of the sensory information if it was fed in from one of the fingertips, you know, because you know, they, they have a sense of vision as well. I mean, it's not very good in rats, but still they've got a sense, of, you know, so I expect they would be able to make sense of, you know, high resolution contact information. Um, what I was thinking they might not be able to do is, you know, if you try to control a full hand, you know, that's a really challenging um, motor task to be able to use a hand usefully because it's such a complicated device. You know, um, I just I kind of think, you know, in, in primates, they've kind of evolved to, you know, there's enough brain in a prime. Primates have quite big brains, probably partly because they, they, that's, that cortical material, motor cortical and, you know, um, a pre pre motor cortex so on you know it's probably needed to be able to control something of the sophistication of the hands that they have but that, that's that's just a guess yeah, so. serena don't you have like a glia if you would add some human glia <laughs> <laughs> oh. i i i was trying to avoid it but um yeah just well let's let's let uh, bobby do you have a question and i could come back and get into astrocytes <laughs> Sure. Yeah, my, my question is really quick. Uh, first off, Nathan, a, a quick compliment to your uh, PowerPoint uh, slide deck. It's very, there. It's very intense. There, there's so much material going on. However, at the same time, it's like really well, well organized, and it kind of interests me to read your work more closely. So I compliment you on that. Like, well, it's just really like a really nice slide deck. Yeah. Um, are Are you or any co colleagues? Uh, I know the scope of your work, as you you mentioned, is kind of refining the three D printing and and what you have already. Uh, yeah. But are you at some at some scope, either yourself or just any neighbors in our community, looking at um, synthetic fascia, like the, the the layer underneath the skin, like like recreating that? The fascia. The, yeah, like the collagen. Um, it, it, the, the, it's like sheets of uh, two 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 dimensional, so to speak, sheets of collagen material. And, and I was actually just thinking about it today, leading up to your talk. Maybe like Twistronics uses sort of graphite sheets at different angles um, for, for different electrical properties. So I, I don't know if anyone in the community is looking to like create synthetic fascia with some sort of um, mechanical material. Um, I don't know. I mean, I have to be honest, I don't know a huge amount about fascia. I mean, I would say the adipose layers, you know, as that's kind of mimicked, but the fascia, I mean, has, is it involved in sensing? Would you say the fascia? What, what, yeah, yeah, and I, I've really been learning more and more about it since the end of 2019 or mid summer of 2020. But even in like athletics or, or human health or human mobility, robotics, like so to speak, it, it's kind of an emerging. It's an emerging uh, part or uh, organelle, like organ in the body that's being studied more and more, and like there are more properties being discovered about it. So I don't know how much on like the actual like robotic side folks are trying to recreate it because on the human side, it's an emerging phenomena like biologically or, or physiologically I, I think i get you now i because I, so I had some physiotherapy recently on my calf and the physiotherapist ran some weird metal tool down it and said i'm scraping your fascia and i think that's what you're talking about isn't it exactly um, exactly yeah um so i'll be honest i'm, I'm completely i don't know um, much about them i mean that actually the physiotherapist is the only, that's the only time i've heard it before um, I I don't know what their role in human contact sensing and human perception is, um, um, but as you say, it's, it sounds important for things like rehabilitation and so I, so basically I don't know and certainly given you know I I've got some biological knowledge as well about how how the you know human sense of touch works and I've never read anything about fascia in that. Uh, for sh because it, I, I would say that nobody in robotics has even thought about it. 
it might be some people in biology have thought about it, but nobody in robotics has even came up, I would have thought. So I've been interested. Interesting. If um, you've got any ideas on it, let me yeah. let me know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe it stays an open area. However, I, I do like what you mentioned there about um the 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 homework. So basically, you you've done on 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 sensing and and and, and touch. It, it didn't include the fascia, so I'll definitely read up more about it. And if I have any ideas or or anything new, I'll, I'll reach out to you. Cool, fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, just throw something random out there. Thank you for taking the time to go back and forth. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Well, so um, I, I guess we've come. I want to come to the point of asking you. We've been going for about an hour and a half. Um, wow. It, how how uh, how much longer do we have you for before we sort of pop a dimension and get into more elaborate control systems? Uh, I, I mean, I don't need to go now, but equally well, I don't want to keep you all here <laughs> if you've got other places to be. So. Oh, oh no! It was just a chance to see if you you have hard stops or if uh, just uh, curious to ask um, if we have you for longer. Yeah, no, I'm I'm still still here. Yeah, I, I, I'm not being dragged out yet. I think. <laughs> okay, well, great. Um, because uh, more elaborate control systems is a deeper interest of mine, and okay. many people uh, in the field, obviously. Um, so I'm curious. You 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 focused on getting um, you know precise uh, s sensory detection out of a fingertip. Yeah. Have you, um, in terms of multiple fingers, or you know, at what point you would might go to two fingers and start coordinating uh, the perception of what those two fingers might be in contact with? Um, have you have you cracked work on that, or is that something that uh, you're really not there yet? And because there's so much more to do on the individual fingertip. That's the ongoing work that's in my lab at the moment. So a lot of this isn't published, but we've got I don't know four or five different projects where we're looking at um, multi multi well multiple tactile sensors, and we've we've got various robot platforms. We're doing that. One that we've been doing a while is that you know when because we integrate the, the tactile sensors as fingertips on robot hands, um, and mm -hmm. you know we've got various robot hands we use with two types with basically three fingers, and then we've got the other one, the piece of IoT hand, which is you know an anthropomorphic hand, so it's got five sensors on. Um, so it's it's kind of more basic tasks we're doing there, like sort of recognition or slip detection. Um, you know, object recognition. Um, some of the recent work we've been doing is sort of trying to hold an object gently. So using the sense of touch to gently hold a, a kind of conform, a pliable object. We that's that's some of the recent work. But we, that's been not on dexterity as such, but more just kind of basic control of the of the hands. And then in terms of the dexterous manipulation. Um, fine control using multiple fingertips. Um, so the way we're going at this is we're basically using multiple robot arms together. Um, and so each robot arm is kind of like a giant finger you could think of it as. So um, we've got some platforms where we've got two robot arms together, um, both with two industrial robot arms. We've got one where we've been pushing at that and doing various things using those together. And also we're doing it with a low cost robot arms as well, using two of those together. But that, I say that's ongoing work at the moment, but it's really the frontier of where we're trying to push out. And, and when you, um, I'd be interested in here, so you, you, it was, you were introduced with, with a neuroscience background, you, you sort of went through that yeah. tour. I'm curious in the field of AI to hear your, um, your characterization of what's lacking in more yeah. generality, um, as in in context to the problems that uh, that you're currently focused on, um, in the, I certainly have my own opinions about this. But where would you say the the real deficiencies are in the current and contemporary approaches to AI when it comes to um, the kind of problems that you're looking at? Well, I, I I mean I think there's several issues with AI, but 
the, the most important in terms of its direction of travel. But the, for me, the most important one is most AI research is non-embodied. It's all done inside the computer. Mm -hmm. It's not in the real world. Beautiful. Yes, the embodiment. Um, I always thought that's such a critical, um, a critical piece. And I, you know, I've often thought that we're not going to get real general intelligence without a body, in yes. that sense. Well, I agree one hundred percent. Yeah, you, that. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Great. No, this is great um, because you know there's the, just the realities of that of closing that con, uh, sensory actuation control loop. Um, yeah. You know, provides unique unique aspects that you know have to be dealt with. And in yeah. terms of um, how you're approaching that, though, uh, could you could you tell us a little more about some of the insights of where you would where you would take um, those approaches in closing that uh, sensory control actuation loop in real time? So, I guess I, I'll add the question a minute, but I'll kind of say, because there's, there's a view in AI that, you know, if you get better and better simulations, they can approximate the real world. And so why could you not develop some kind of general intelligence in that simulation? But I personally believe that's wrong because, you know, mm -hmm. simulation can never, there's this saying, you know, sim simulations are doomed to succeed. You know, there's, there's, they, they, <laughs> you can never capture the, capture the intricacies of the real world in simulation. I strongly believe that. And, you know, I think in robotics as well, I, I don't, I do not believe in simulation only robotics, robots just in simulation. I believe any, any work in robotics that a simulation that it must have a real robot as well. I strongly, and it relates to the embodiment. Um, so that's my rant on that. <laughs> but but on how that relates to, uh, I guess, the path for, you know, working towards more, how do you bring in knowledge from biology or, or human intelligence into AI? Um, I guess where, where I came from, actually, because I came from biology into robotics, my motivations were actually to understand um, human intelligence, and and I saw you know the embodiment of the human hand and the human sense of touch as a key way of um, you know testing, developing, and looking into how human the kind of capacities that human intelligence would need in order to to to, to use those devices. So that was the motivation for me. Um, uh, but <laughs> what's happened is the the. I've kind of drifted away from that because actually the problems have come down to kind of control problems and then deep learning came along, which came along after, you know, I got into the field and has really kind of transformed, uh, certainly in my lab, and, but also in lots of other labs, the capabilities to, to make sense of this tactile information uh, to control these hands. So I've kind of got, that's where my focus is at the moment. But I do believe that by kind of getting on that handle on how in robotics, you're able to solve these problems of the sensory motor loop and fine control and dexterous use of robot hands. When answers come out of that, which is not there yet, that will give a route, you'll be able to feed back from that. It, that will give a reshaping of artificial intelligence because you know artificial intelligence can be part of that, that progress. That could give a reshaping of artificial intelligence that could give a better platform for you know studying embodiments and actually dealing with embodied AI properly. Because mm -hmm. um, well, so it, it it does, and and you, you know, may have guessed I'm kind of you know nudging us in the direction here. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the um, you know interests that I've, I'm I'm looking at recently in terms of more recent developments in neuroscience and how we might yeah. apply them to AI has been um, looking at, uh, you know, what the what glial structures and astrocytes mm. in particular might be doing uh, with and for neural computation. Mm. And, and part of that, um, what's, what's uh, I'm finding quite interesting is um, how they're, they've been known to or more appreciate more recently appreciated to drive neural synchronous firing mm. and um, bringing together many, many distant groups of neurons in more organized and synchronous behaviors. And I'm wondering if, if you've, um, if you're familiar with any of the, you know, the, the recent work in, and have thought about 
that in um, in terms of uh, you know more detailed control systems for for your work. Uh, so it, it used to be something that I was kind of more familiar with when I was working in computational neuroscience and for a long while. But I, I, I say I kind of drifted away from it. But maybe maybe the way maybe to fit in with you know your idea, perhaps the way the field goes is imagine first of all you start doing more. I mean this could apply to AI and you know computer vision as well, deep learning and computer vision. Suppose you start pushing mm -hmm. these forwards solving these tasks with you know conventional you know neural network methods you know and then then there's you know questions can you then use neural networks that are more similar to the structures in the brain can you take more inspiration from from brain structures and i think in particular it's kind of identifying something that those neural networks aren't able to do well and then finding some structures in the brain or some functionality in the brain that you can kind of feed into them and would you know would allow them to solve problems that you couldn't do otherwise and it may be some analog of the glial structures or some you know si some large-scale synchronicity some you know, it's, you know it sounds like they they label a kind of non-local structure whereas most neural networks as i understand it are very local in their in their computation so maybe maybe that will become important um, well yeah it's it's interesting because the the models need to improve in in both directions, we need much yes. better models of neurons, and um, you know, and what what's going on in there, you know, to the synaptic level and in the dendrites yeah. as well. But then, um, and of course, there's you know, very practical barriers to that in terms of you know, the models are going to get much more expensive yeah. very quickly. But in in terms of the astrocytes, they they connect and modulate at the synaptic level. Um, but to have a, a sensation where calcium waves will coordinate over uh, very large spatial dimensions relatively to, to you know, harness the synchronous um, firing of those neurons. So it's really that dialogue between mm. astrocytes and neurons that um, is, is um, you know, becoming more prominent in understanding the higher cognition. Um, so looking for ways of approaching that in in modeling, um, but then uh, having that approach first in simulation, much to your earlier point, but but moving that towards physical embodiments that yeah. can actually you know, bring the real time feedback and uh, into the picture, and yeah. um, hopefully yeah. that yeah, can spawn yeah. development of more neuromorphic hardware and and. Mm. And these types of more physical systems where we can leverage natural computation in that Ab loop. Ab absolutely. I mean, I, I know people who are working on, you know, neurotransmitters and and so on. And, you know, and the kind of trying to use those as inspiration for improved um, computation in, in in deep learning. And I could I could see exact a story as, as well coming out of astrocytes glia. I can see I can see how it can fit. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris, did you have a question? I see you just came on on stage again. Um, I'm curious, essentially, what were when you were developing some of the touch related technologies, were there other things that you looked for in the literature, like historically, like some unusual pathways that you didn't actually end up pursuing, but you're like, oh man, if I like quadruple the research huh. funding, I totally want to follow up on that thing. What would that that thing be? Oh wow! If I had more money, what would I do? <laughs> well, I suppose I've been fortunate for the last week because I've got this Leverhulme Leadership Award, so um, which is coming to an end soon, unfortunately. So I have been very quite well funded, um, and in a sense, the way I've tried to take things is actually to make it cheaper to do research because, like I say, I believe this accessibility is really important. So. Because of that, I kind of purposely moved away from doing expensive research. So I, if, what would I do with lots more money? Well, I think what, what, what the most important thing you could do with lots more money is hire more researchers. Because I do think, I mean, this isn't, a, there's not a lot of researchers working in this area. I'd say there's maybe 50 PIs altogether in robot touch, maybe a handful, five to 10 PIs who work on the kind of high resolution touch like I do. Um, so, and I do believe some of these problems you know, it's, to push this forward needs a very large research team to kind of tackle it. 
So I, I think that would be the most important use of the money I would see it as to get more people working in the area. Would you prefer to have them in your own lab or just collaborators from other fields randomly working on their own spaces and then kind of bring those ideas in? What would you prefer? I would really prefer that other people start developing similar technologies themselves and spread in other labs doing this. I would obviously like to have a lab that's a reasonable size myself, but I think for me, what actually motivates me far more is enabling others to be able to take this forward. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we we were been going for almost two hours and it was such an interesting discussion and thank you Serena for all those really interesting questions um, it was uh, exciting to listen to the discussion and um, thank you so much for taking the time and coming here um, hopefully you come back one day with maybe updates maybe some rats with hands <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> I think thanks, thanks everybody for such. I mean, it's been a really stimulating discussion, and I've I've learned a lot, um, you know, from people's questions. So I've really enjoyed this. It's been an amazing experience. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been so so interesting. I really appreciate your time. We all do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming, asking questions, and yeah, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Rest of Friday, happy Friday. I know your Friday is almost over. Um, and uh, yeah, this was really amazing. Thank you so much. We were really looking forward to this discussion. And I think, you know, we had a lot of fun. We seem to enjoy it. So it was amazing. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah. And we wish you all the best. And hopefully, we have soon a lot of Adam's family hands running around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> thank you goodbye bye bye, -bye. thank you thanks thank you three two thanks. bye, bye everyone, everyone.